I didn't actually see the whole debate with you and Destiny, but I saw <laughs> your response video where afterwards you basically said, hey, here are the sources that I mentioned. Let me show yeah. you those. Let me correct the record. And you, you know, very systematically went through what happened in that debate. Tell me, tell, every, tell everybody about that debate. Like what sure. went down? What were the points of contention? And, you know, you felt like you had to come out and say, hey, for the record, this is this. So yeah. uh, lay that all out for everybody. So full disclosure, I did not know who Destiny was when I walked into that debate, to be honest with you. I just saw that he was challenging somebody else to come on their podcast and, and argue about something or the other. Hmm. And um, I heard he was really famous and really big and it's a big podcast, so maybe you should do it. Tweeted at him. He invited me on. It all happened very quickly. And I was frankly impressed by how smart he are. I can't, I can't, uh, how, how smart he is. I can't take that away from him. For somebody who does not know anything about this topic, <laughs> to have given me as part of time as he has, I thought was really impressive. Um, so it's just, he's rhetorically talented. He knows how to move the ball in a way that you're constantly chasing one argument to the other. And it was a deeply frustrating conversation in the course of it. And we constantly disagreed on basic facts in which I would point out that what he's saying is wrong. And he would insist that it's correct and that I don't know what I'm talking about. And if you don't know who's actually telling the truth watching it, the level of confidence that he exuded in that moment would leave you fairly convinced that he might actually be correct. Um, and afterwards, you know, we just had a back and forth in which I said that I'm gonna piece together some resources on the issues that we're disagreeing on and point out where he's actually wrong and where I'm correct. And then for days after that, um, his followers were taunting me for not posting a follow-up video where I promised to share the sources. So I finally did piece that video together, outlined exactly where he is wrong, um, the video really speaks for itself. It's, from my perspective, absolutely devastating in terms of outlining how he doesn't know what he's talking about and got some of the most fundamental and basic facts wrong. But nonetheless, his cult following is so committed that what I ended up with is basically an onslaught after that, mocking me for having made a video because I'm so sour for having lost the debate. The <laughs> entire thing just reeks of WWE. It's the last thing on my mind to be competing over who won or lost an argument. It's the most trivial of concerns in the face of what we're witnessing in Gaza, a real genocide that is unfolding where people that I know in real life, friends of mine, have lost their immediate family members. The last thing on my mind is, you know, who has bragging rights over winning or losing a debate. But nonetheless, Destiny is a talented human being who is able to hang in an argument in which he doesn't know what he's talking about and has no fundamental uh, grasp of the most basic facts. And, you know, it's in the age of social media, it tells you something about how talented grifters don't need to know the basic facts or have a real genuine moral investment. You know, it's not as if Destiny is trying to figure out what is really the morally correct position to take here. For him, the whole thing is a sport. He'll debate mm -hmm. any topic on anything, anytime. Um, and that just can actually, in fact, be a waste of time rather than my initial thought of this is an opportunity to expose a large audience to the reality that Palestinians are experiencing under Israel's atrocities that are backed by the U.S. It ended up being just this utter waste of time um, in terms of just trading, trading talking points and, um, and shifting, kind of just having an argument for argument's sake. Um, yeah, there's a market for that in this current social media age. But from my perspective, it's not really the best use of time. So what's your take on how he got to the place he is on this issue? Because as an outsider, from what I've seen of him talking about this issue, it strikes me that he's had like an ongoing feud with the left. He used to be viewed as like, I'm the lefty debate guy streamer. He was like the only game in town for a while. And then after a while, you know, according to him, he says, I looked at my audience and I realize um, I have all these people who are like communists and socialists in my audience. And some of them are tankies who would like defend the old Soviet Union. He was really put off by that. He was really disgusted by that. And it was at that time that he tried to pivot is one way to say it. it go towards more. No, no, no. I'm not. I'm not a lefty. I'm like a center left guy. Right. Yeah. And then in the process of doing that, you know, every now and then he might have a conservative take on one issue over here, one issue over there. But ultimately, I think his lane that he's trying to stay in is sort of enlightened centrist or center left kind of guy. And he fancies himself like I'm the truth teller on the left. But you come across or I'm the truth teller on the teller on the center left or in the mm -hmm. center or whatever. Um, but on this issue in particular, my, my hunch and maybe this is unfair, I don't know. But my hunch is 
he saw the reaction of these lefties that he hates, these people who he thinks are communists and socialists and tankies, and he thinks they're unthoughtful and not well-read and don't care about data and all that stuff. And he sees the outrage about how the left is going on and on, and it's an ethnic cleansing and it's a genocide. And, oh, my God, they were saying that when it was like seven days in, and that was way too early to make a call like that. And they're insistent and they're loud and they're aggressive and they don't allow any nuance in the conversation. And then he feels like, I feel like his gut reaction was, well, let me see where the Israelis are coming from, right? And then he learns the narrative from that perspective and then in these debates, he takes that position and he's going to joust from the perspective of, let me give you the Israeli uh, reaction and response. And my sense of it is it started with like a little intuition that I hate these people on the left and they're all saying it's a genocide and they're on the side of Palestinians. So now that pushes him a little more in the direction of let me see the Israeli perspective. And then it becomes, to your point, in a debate with somebody who's very well educated and knows what they're talking about on this issue like yourself, it's almost like that instinct becomes just massively contrarian and now he's trying to take issue with like every little thing you say and he's got he doesn't view you as you he views you as like an avatar of these dumb communist socialist lefties who don't think about the issue and just you know reflexively take a position so my sense it's a kind it's kind of like motivated reasoning right like i have this intuition left the lefties are stupid i hate them so i'm going to look the perspective from the other side. Let me figure out how they're wrong. Right. It kind of like arguing like a lawyer type thing. Here's my position. Now I will work backwards from that. And, you know, it's ironic because I'm sure he would say this is what the lefties do. But like it kind of looks like you're doing the same thing. Is that is that your sense that it's almost like motivated reasoning that got him to this position? Because I agree with you. I think he actually is a brilliant guy. And it's always interesting when, you know, you watch a clip on something when he is correct and you're like, God damn, man, he killed it. You know, but then you see it's sort of like Bill Maher, mm. like when Bill Maher says something correct. It's like, oh, Bill Maher. Nice. But then the second he what, says like, something wrong, you're like, like this guy ago. is the biggest. Fu <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you look at you look at him when he's wrong and you're like, this guy's the biggest fucking asshole. And I never want to watch another episode of this show again. Right. They just yeah. give you that reaction. So is that your sense, too, on Destiny? It's like motivated reasoning type thing, because he talked to Mark Lamont Hill and they surprised to my shock on about this issue. They were actually able to kind of navigate it. And Destiny was even giving him credit at the end of it. So it's yeah. interesting to me that it didn't work out well your discussion with him because i put you in the same category as mark lamont hill very well educated on this topic good at explaining things to people so i'm kind of surprised it didn't work out so I'll, I'll tell you my sense of the his debate with mark lamont hill i think the primary point of contrast is mark lamont hill was a lot more patient than i am uh, <laughs> i think that's right endless, i think you're right i think you're right he just threw <laughs> endless nonsense at him and instead of just being bewildered by the amount of nonsense being thrown at him he just very patiently said, okay, and let's talk through it and figure it out and this and that in a way that when somebody is just spitting lies at me 24 seven, I mean, it's just, it's, it's very difficult to take that uh, seriously. I will say that there is a point of difference between somebody like Bill Maher and somebody like Destiny. In the case of Bill Maher, I think it is deeply emotional connection to Israel that makes him irrational on this topic. He's otherwise a reasonable guy, has very thoughtful takes on a lot of stuff, but you know, when it comes to certain issues, those just hit on the emotional side, he gets very hostile. Bill Maher has never had a repeat appearance of somebody who's defended Palestinians on his show. Glenn Greenwald once did a very good job, wiped the floor with Bill Maher. Bill, Glenn Greenwald was never shown, seen on that show again. Reza and the Aslan. same is true yeah, of Riz Aslan and many others. You know, Bill fancies himself as somebody who is up for open debate and open discussion and welcoming all perspectives. Mm -hmm. And he'll have on Milo Yiannopoulos and the more provocative, the better but only in a specific direction. He's right. happy to have fights with right-wingers he disagrees with, but somebody who can hold his feet to the fire from the left and somebody who can really hold his feet to the fire specifically on his on this issue where, you know, explaining how indefensible his position on Israel is, um, those are people that he does not like to talk to. And I've actually, you know, tried to get on that show before and, you know, it, I, I just don't think that I ever stood a chance precisely because this is a deeply emotional issue for him in which he is unwilling to engage. I think Destiny is very, very different. Destiny will debate absolutely anyone because he doesn't really care about any of these issues at the end of the day. It is just sport for him. And I think that he did stake out a position in which he wanted to be the centrist voice of reason on this issue. It's like, yes, you've got the, raise, the crazy right-wing Israelis and crazy left-wing Palestinians or whatever, but somewhere in the middle, I'm going to tell you the real facts. He's both sides in it, telling you how both sides are to blame, but he's willing to evolve his position along the way. It's interesting to me that during the course of our debate, some of the things that I proved him wrong on, he was willing to take back in subsequent videos that he's posted, in which he says, yeah, 
I no longer think that settlements are fine or that they're not an impediment to peace or whatever. He's showing a willingness to kind of like moderate and learn and expand his knowledge. Um, but at the end of the day, he's still sticking. And I've seen this happen a lot where people, because of personal antagonism, because people taunt him for having a shitty position on this issue, that that entrenches them a little bit. Yeah. So even mm -hmm. as he gets more enlightened um, and open-minded about this issue, he's never going to really embrace the correct position on it because he's already placed himself um, in this box of being in opposition to people who are super anti-Israel. And he wants to make sure that he's a contrast to that. But what's remarkable to me is his inclusion. You know, you have this Lex Friedman character who's all about peace and love and understanding and real conversations and not fighting and this and that. The fact that you would host Destiny in a debate that features otherwise yeah. world experts on this issue, Norman Finkelstein and Marianne Rabani, and even the right-wing uh, historian, Benny Morris, is also a deep expert on this, despite being right-wing. These are all deep experts. And the fact that Destiny can even make the case to somebody like Lex that he even passes to be in the same league and part of the same conversation is an achievement. A week before that debate, he was talking on his podcast about how uh, Hamas is a Shia group, and that's why Iran supports them. Completely wrong. Yeah, like just that's not true. <laughs> the level of ignorance that he true. has about this is unbelievable. And again, it's just it's it's a testament to his talent. And you know, it's funny after our argument and after I made that video, which he obviously hated, um, kind of retorting and, and exposing his grift on all of this. He sent me a, a private message saying, "Enjoy your grift." at the expense of dead Palestinian children or whatever it is. Oh my God. Jesus Christ. I, I just felt that that was, you know, the most revealing thing is that it, it was an expression of projection. None mm. of my social media is monetized. I don't make a penny about anything. I'm talking to you right now on this show about this stuff. I'm not making any money off of it. For me, this is a deeply personal issue in which I'm invested in educating the American public about because it has real consequences on the lives of people. But from his perspective, he thinks that's a nice little, you know, own, Mm. On the assumption that we're we're all in, that we're all doing the same thing, yeah. that we're all bullshitting our way through these debates, and we're all only doing it for the sake of self promotion and getting clicks and hits, and yeah, who knows? Maybe with I don't know how old he is, but hopefully his attitude on this can mature over time, and he can start taking these kinds of issues more seriously and deep more deeply understand what's actually at stake. I think he's like mid thirties, so yeah, I think he's a he year should, a year or two younger than me. He should I think have some 35, fully formed world like views that. on things yeah. that well, are like you know, that. But it's shocking to me though that he's he is this guy who will debate anybody and that's true. That's just objectively the case. You look yeah. at his thing. In my mind, the people who are willing to engage like that, typically they're the ones who after the fact, there is no ill will there is no right go fuck yourself it is a game you know? to him so it's like yeah you're my sparring partner we did our thing you yeah you, know, you would think in the circus it's and probably that the, the video you made with all like here are the corrections here are the sources etc from his perspective think, he probably thought like, this exactly makes me look it. shitty right yeah that video was absolutely devastating i mean it's just it completely breaks down everything that he's about and just displays his ignorance in a way that he cannot refute and I think that's precisely why he became a lot more hostile as a result. But it you is know, what it is. And, you know. One thing I'm realizing, there is a through line with Fetterman, Bill Maher, Destiny, that I think is kind of a consistent theme in American life. You see this with Joe Biden as well, which is the immediate dismissal and assumption that any critique from the left is illegitimate. You know, like you see with Biden... Um, his two lowest rated issues are immigration and Gaza. Well, immigration, since the you know loudest critique comes from the right, or that's the area where he feels the pressure, oh, well, he'll immediately cave and just become like Donald, literally reach out his hand to Donald Trump, who five seconds ago, all the Democrats were saying are fascists on the border to help him develop his border policy. But when it's Gaza and the critique comes from the left, well, that, you know, maybe finally when he can no longer deny it, he'll do a little rhetorical shift. But there's just a, an assumption that any sort of critique from the left can be dismissed, isn't serious, is illegitimate, that I think has sort of deep roots. That's in, a relic of the, the Clinton country. era. You know, that's a relic of that's the new Democrats, the neoliberal 
yeah, uh, idea. I, I think so too. I do think it goes yeah. back to that. And this idea of like triangulation, triangulation and, that's right. and punching left and you know, that's the way you win over. Show them I'm serious. Mm -hmm. I'm a serious man. Yeah. I'm not like these they, other like group think lefties. Yeah, you know? that's the beltway conventional wisdom is that whatever the lefties are saying, we need to position ourselves in opposition to that. Yeah, it's it's I think they view themselves as the gatekeepers for what is progressive. And if you go one inch to their left, then clearly you're just allegedly a contrarian who's just like, you know, there to argue for the sake of arguing rather than really reflecting on whether their position is adequately progressive. There is the sense that they see it, they see themselves as guardians of liberal thought and that they're supposed to be in opposition to right wingers. And that's the range of the debate. And if you expand the range of the debate beyond their comfort zone, they get very, very hostile. They're not used to being critiqued from the left and that just is an uncomfortable position for them. Yeah, but it's so funny to me because that's also, you just listed three people that fit in that category. If we just sit here and think about it for a little, we could probably come up with 10 more mm -hmm. that fit in that category. Sam Harris, it, you could actually yeah, build a no, pretty Exactly, pretty so it's like, it, this isn't as highfalutin as you think it is, all right? Like, this, like, you're also doing a version of groupthink in a sense. Yeah, because you know you're, I mean? you're not coming up with your own position. You're looking at where is this group of people right. and let me put myself in it's opposition like, to it. It's like, I always make this analogy, but it's like the goth kids in high school where it's like, pfft, I'm rebellious. I'm not like anybody else. I'm different. And to prove that, here are my group of 10 friends that dress exactly the same as I do and listen to the exact same music. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. no, you're just doing your own version. Yes, it's counterculture, but it's really your own version of a dominant culture, right? So it's not as special as you think it is. Yeah. Well, especially they pretend like they're rebellious and they're literally are fully parroting the dominant status quo culture, you know, and like they're so brave for saying it. And, and yeah. here's just, I'll, I'll add one more thing just on Sam Harris in particular. And, and I honestly don't know how, you know, it's, it's a complicated one to address because there is a difference between Sam Harris and then, you know, people who are so open in their bigotry that it's obviously just a grift. When you think of somebody like Pamela Geller, there are people who are just openly bigots. They know they're being bigoted and they do it for provocation, for money. Sam Harris doesn't quite fit in that category, but nonetheless, his analysis is influenced by a deep bias against Arabs and Muslims. There's really no way to square how somebody that intelligent and that bright can look at an issue like Israel-Palestine among a few other issues um, and come to the insane conclusions that he makes that it's all Palestinian culture and Islamic religion. Like his default to always blaming these things instead of what is transparently the driving force that you look at two groups of people, one group has rights and all the power and another group has no power and no rights and not be able to figure out why there is a conflict is is insane and it's just incredibly challenging because people like that are extremely hostile to the idea that they have biases that they're not aware of or that they are being a little bit racist or islamophobic or whatever it's it's a topic that is very difficult to broach and i know that you've attempted it in the past kyle with uh, both glenn and sam at some point kind of like trying to have them reach a sensible middle ground on this and kind of like see that they have more in common than they disagree with but sam at the end of the day is not willing to examine his biases. I was certain that after all that time had gone and after all these debates that are now, that are now very old with Riza Aslan and the rest of them, that when something like this happened in, in Gaza, that he would be a more sensible human being and to see him revert to the most ugly anti-Palestinian, anti-Arab and anti-Muslim um, stereotypes and talking points to explain what we're seeing. Um, yeah, you just kind of like it's, throw your hands I, in the air and say it's hopeless. There's there, we, we can't get to a better place. Ironically, here. Ironically, he's a very tribal thinker. And I say yeah. ironically because he's the kind of guy to decry tribalism and act like I'm above that and I'm above sectarianism. Exactly. Then you hear him talk about Israel and Palestine and all of a sudden it's this is a civilizational battle mm -hmm. and it's almost all about religion. And here you have the enlightened forces on one side and the unenlightened force on the other side. It's like you sound like fucking Netanyahu right now. If you look at that conflict and your main thought is to go right to religion as opposed to history, you know, like you have to understand the background and how we got to where we are, understand the Nakba, understand the partition plan, understand that we're dealing with human beings here, right? And and it's a it's a political thing and, and territorial. It's not it's not about religion. The fact that he goes right to religion is just astonishing to me. It's astonishingly stupid. And it strikes me he's working backwards from his conclusion of like, you know, the Muslims, they're unreasonable. So let me square peg and round hole this thing to make it seem like the Muslims are being unreasonable. Yeah, they're always the, the barbarians, right? The uncivilized ones. It is very much that Netanyahu framing of what do you say? The children of the light versus the children of the darkness. I mean, that that is Jesus the Sam Harris Christ. view, you know? Yeah.
Um, well, Omar, thank you so much uh, for joining us, even though I know your your throat is not 100 percent. We hope you feel better soon. And um, do tell people where they can follow you. Uh, sure. I mean, the easiest places to find me are Twitter, just my name at Omar Badar or Instagram at Obadar. That's probably where I'm most active. But um, thank you, guys. It's always really great having conversations with you. They're always enlightening and interesting. So thank you for the time as well. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. Feel better. Yeah, appreciate you, Omar. Thanks. Thank you.